Hello and welcome to the Inheritance Podcast. I'm Joe Riley. I've been in the family office world for 20 years and believe it as well to focus on the human capital side of family office work. Today we are talking to Coventry Edwards Pitt, author of Engaged, Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise. And we'll be talking about the challenges of inheritors in love and marriage, self-actualization, the stumbling block of prenuptial agreements, and the desire to break free from the constraints of onerous wealth management infrastructures. Covey is a partner and the chief created officer of Ballantine Partners in Boston. She is the author of three excellent books based on extensive interviews with the wealthy. Raised Healthy, Wealthy and Wise was her first book, which covered raising children. Her second book was Aged, Healthy, Wealthy and Wise, which focused on vibrancy in later life. And today we are talking about engaged, healthy, wealthy, and wise, where she talks about love and marriage. Covey is a graduate of Harvard and was the chief of staff of Goldman Sachs Global Manager Strategies Group, as well as the leader of her own financial advisory firm before joining Ballantine Partners. Covey is a CFA charter holder, a trained opera singer and a pianist, a member of the Women's President Organization, and the collaboration for family flourishing. Please note this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment or legal decisions. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are solely their own opinion and do not necessarily reflect that of their firms. The manager's appearance on this show does not constitute an endorsement or an investment recommendation from the podcast host or his firm. Tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us how you got into wealth management instead of becoming an opera singer. Yes. Thank you, Joe. The trip down memory lane. Okay. So let me be concise. I was, believe it or not, pre-med all through undergrad for the very specific reason that I am a helper person. And I just thought, what could be better than being in the arena of life and death and helping people at the most critical time in their life? And then I ended up choosing not to go into medicine because it's so crazy how life works. But at the very time that I was thinking about applying to medical school, a number of my doctors told me they wouldn't choose the field anymore. And the reason they gave was that the economics were changing, not that you wouldn't make money, but that you couldn't control your day sufficiently so that you could have the time you wanted to have with patients and feel good about the work you were doing. And that kind of apologies to any doctors listening. I'm sure, I'm sure that there are ways to create that outcome, but it really frightened me a little bit because I didn't want to be locked into a situation where I didn't feel like I could serve my patients in a way that felt good to me. And then I was like, what do I do now? Cause I had been my, I had taken not one economics class. I had been all in. I had studied history of science, theories of the mind and consciousness, and had taken pre-med classes. So meanwhile, my mother was very clear that when I got out of college, I needed a job and I needed to support myself. I was very grateful that Goldman Sachs came on campus. They recruited and they hired me, even though I didn't feel like I had very many skills, but they hired me into a role that at the time was, I needed to be, I guess, with people. And they ended up changing that group in three months. And I ended up very luckily being part of Goldman's first group that was dealing with open architecture and hiring external to Goldman money managers, working for a wonderful woman who they had hired in laterally from Barra Rogers Casey, Trace McHale Stewart, who is still a very good friend and a mentor to me, who I got to work for four years. And so I learned about investing and I had the crazy job of traveling around the world and interviewing money managers. They must have been like, why am I having to tell this woman who is out of college why she should hire me. But it was a great trial by fire introduction to the investment industry. Was sure. That was during the dot-com era. Oh, yes. That was one of my projects. Find the best dot-com manager. You should have seen the marketing materials that I was sent, Joe. Oh, they were so shiny, shiny and metallic. Yes, I was at Goldman from 98 to 02. I'm very interested in what you learned about talking to managers and how to pick good managers. Oh, yeah. I actually love that role because, as you can imagine, it's very much about people and organizational behavior and understanding, trying to read between the lines and get beneath the marketing material to discern whether someone is actually good at what they do and whether they can continue to be good at what they do. 
And I actually learned, I think every career is a strung together collection of humbling experiences. <laughs> but I think one of the things I most learned was how difficult it is to succeed in active management. Because after I worked my way up and I proved I was doing a good job and due diligence thing and whatever, I was given the task of picking an emerging markets manager. And I did all my research and I worked really hard and I picked a manager. I won't say who now. Anyway, wouldn't you know, the minute I picked this firm, which by the way, my colleagues agreed was a great choice, they started to underperform. I think I just learned mean reversion. Active management is very challenging. And the only performance that is truly persistent is underperformance. <laughs> There are areas in the market, obviously, where active management is more worth it, private, et cetera, but long only active management, not easy. And then I'll just share the, I think the other thing that careers are a compilation of pivotal moments. And a pivotal moment for me was a colleague I knew, not particularly well, but we were friendly. We saw each other in the cafeteria. She was in another group. She, about four years into my time at Goldman, she went on a vacation with her family, her parents. She was in her mid-30s and they got into a tragic car accident and she died. And I just remember it was so shocking to see someone that young die. And like all things, when we have a reminder that we're all here for a finite time on earth, I looked within. And I thought, if this happened to me, could I say right now that I feel like I've been true to my calling of really helping people? And I couldn't. It may be long line. <laughs> I was picking good managers to hopefully help people who were in pension plans, but it was too many dots to have to connect. My husband and I got married. We moved back to Boston. I decided to try to really figure out something I could do that would be more that. And in that whole process, I discovered the world of the only financial planning. And that was like a miracle to me because being at a bank environment, I really hadn't known that that type of thing exists where you're not selling products. You're just truly sitting on the same side of the table as the client and just trying to help them navigate all of these issues. And it reminded me of medicine. You have this technical expertise that is like your foot in the door, but really what you're engaging in is a human relationship. And you're trying to help this person have a life that is more meaningful and more satisfying to them. And so I thought, that sounds good. That sounds like a good thing for me. So that's when I joined our firm, which Joe was now, oh my gosh, 2004. So this and is literally your second job? Yep. Yeah. I had a brief stint where I tried to, this is also fascinating, my entrepreneurial instincts. Because I had spent four years evaluating money managers, I was like, maybe I could go talk to these same people and tell them, why don't you let me give you the score I would have given you and see if you can then use that to improve your business before you're dinged. It was fascinating. I'm 20, whatever, three, trying to call around the world. I think it was an excellent experience in self-marketing and trying to do that, but it's lonely working by yourself. So what, what advice would you give them? A lot of it was being really thoughtful. I think that people rush to get to scale and to get to performance that they can sell. But so much of what I did look for and saw in firms that lasted were they care about the people. They care about the talent retention. They care about the culture. They care about that being consistent. I remember years and years ago, Capital Guardian was a an example of, and of course, Wellington, which continues to be a firm that not only puts out excellent product and performance, but seems to really have a special culture, which attracts people and keeps people there. But yeah, so then I entered the world of fee-only advising. And at Ballantyne, I found a firm that was focused on really large, complex families, like I had been familiar with through Goldman. And Roy hired me, and it was great. And I've been here ever since. What's changed in wealth management over the last 20 years? You mentioned in your book, there's been a shift from just focusing on the money to the focusing on the well-being of the family. That is such a good question, Joe. I'm an optimist. Let me focus on the good first. The good is the model of comprehensive wealth advising that looks at not just the alpha you're generating in the portfolio, but understands that there are other things that matter. And whether it's in the most narrow definition, you should have an estate plan that works, you should have insurance, or whether it's a broader definition, let's actually think about whether money is helping you be a happier person and whether your kids are all right. That has now become the defining model in the industry, which is great. Whether people are actually implementing it and really doing it is another question because I think it's still, if you're a consumer in this world, I think it's very hard to evaluate 
at the first meeting whether these people who say they'll do all this stuff will actually do it and be good at it. And I think, sadly, the economics of the industry are still such that firms are incentivized to scale up assets. If a firm charges only on AUM in the door or AUM into products, it's a different economic situation than, say, you're charging a flat fee for consultative services that really range across that entire spectrum. So there's stuff that's still left on the table, but I would say I am glad that now these people are talking about the fact that you need to really look at all of these aspects of a client's situation. And I do think, I think it was Scott Peppett who just released the MLF ratio, money, legal, family, and encouraging people to spend more money on more time on family versus money and legal. That's great. I hope people will do that. I do caution the book about, I think there's a downside to that, that we can go overboard with all of us well-meaning advisors focus with laser attention on helping a young inheritor develop their potential. I think sometimes that's not what that young person needs. They need some space to go and try to prove to themselves that they can be independent. And having a cadre of advisors trying to help smooth that road for them is sometimes counterproductive. You've got three books now. Your first was about raising children. Second was about aging. And this new one is about relationships. I wanted to ask you about your process. You've done a lot of interviews for these books. They have a really wonderful feel to them. They're very easy to read. You've managed to integrate interviews, psychological studies, your own field work, but it's also something that you can actually sit down and read and enjoy the stories. So I'm wondering how you make all of that work. Thank you, Joe. It's not easy, I'll say. Anyone who's written a book knows it's not easy, but I do have a very specific process. I'm a very linear thinker. Every book starts with a one page, it's literally a one page table of contents. I have a concept of the types of issues that need to be addressed. And then as I do those interviews, and it's usually 50 or so interviews over multiple years, thousand plus page of transcripts, it's this iterative process of checking whether the topics I thought that we needed to cover are the right topics, questioning whether any assumptions that were in even that selection of topics are right or wrong, And then starting to fill into this one page that I started with becomes about a 150-page outline of building all of the detail of the hypotheses and the stories. And I love doing literature reviews. We've had a lot of wonderful content produced in our industry, and I definitely don't want to reinvent the wheel in any way. So I, And I also don't want to neglect important contributions that others have made. So I literally had to build it. My husband built a new bookshelf for me once we went to work from home because there's a lot more room in the office. But since I largely wrote this at home, I now have two more bookshelves that are filled with other books from our industry that I read and tried to include the salient points from. And then I try to, in the writing, pull in these different parts to keep the momentum going because I really think these books are about the stories. That's why I write them. I write them to give a platform to the voices of the people I have interviewed. And this book, Joe, in particular, I mean, there were so many people, these inheritors and their partners who I talked with, there were tears. You were right that I saved the hardest book for last. It's hallowed ground that I was on in these interviews of wealth, trust, marriage. But a number of the people I interviewed said, A, I wish I had a book like this earlier in my life. And B, you have got to tell people what we went through. You've got to share this with people so other people don't have to go through this and that they know there's a better way. And so I felt a tremendous duty really to these people I interviewed to not only get their stories out there, but to capture their stories in a accurate way that reflects their experience. So That really is the meat of it. And then I wanted to round out those stories with both other content from our industry, but then just from life. We're talking about love. These are universal concepts that I think people really can relate to. I quote from Viktor Frankl and his own recollection of his wife's face when he was on a concentration camp death march and how meaningful that was for him. So I, I think there's There are very deep human concepts that are ones we can all relate to, but I wanted to show how those tie into these inheritor and partners' unique experiences having to 
integrate that universal concept of love with wealth and how they've done that. Why do you think it's so hard to transmit wisdom about wealth? I think it's because I've really come to think it's because, and I hope I will change this in a small degree with this book, the lens is not focused on these couples. As a whole, our industry comes at it typically from their parents' point of view, someone else's point of view. And I say in the intro, when a young inheritor comes and tells someone, I met the one, and I, this is it, and we want to get married, the wealth advising industry's wheels were into motion. We've got advisors recommending prenups. We've got best practice white papers about onboarding the partner, all this stuff. And I say, amid all this, there's a couple in love. You know, and what does it feel like to be these people, either the inheritor who has probably spent a good portion of their life to date just trying to individuate from this family wealth and become their own person? And then their partner, for whom much of this is like completely irrelevant. <laughs> Maybe it's nice and interesting, but it's not integrally related to how they feel about their loved one and their own visions for their life together. And so I just am talking about that almost sort of cataclysmic conflict between what it's like to be those young people and this tender time of life full of possibility. And when that runs smack into all of this other stuff that tends to descend upon them and trying to make all of us who play a role in that, in this industry, be aware of this perspective of these people so that we can inform our recommended strategies and our own actions. There's literally eight things that I will never do the same as an advisor based on what I heard from these people. Such as? One thing which might surprise people, because you know I did write a book about how to raise children well amid wealth, but overhelping. I think as advisors, we tend to say to the parents, hire us for a multi-generational wealth experience. We'll make things for your family easy. We do this all as a one-stop shop. What that translates to sometimes is helping these 20 to 30-year-olds who are at that critical time in life where they have to prove that they can master these adulting skills, helping them too much, calling a young person five times to remind them to get a tax form in, or helping them get all the details done in a lease so they don't have to think about any of that themselves. What that can mean is that person gets to age 30, looks around at friends who didn't have all that help, and thinks, how do they know how to do all that? I don't know how to do all that. And so I've learned that really the best advice I can give the whole family is to say, I want to help your kids get to 35 and feel capable and confident. What that means is I'm going to tell you all right now that the best thing I might be able to do for them is not call five times the reminder. <laughs> I want them to understand that some things they need to take the responsibility on themselves and they will feel better for having done that and having learned how to do that. This is like moving a whole ship around in the industry because I think that many of our very holistic, comprehensive firms have defined excellent client service by offering all the reminders. <laughs> so that's one example. And I'd say just wrapping it all up, seeing the partner as the inheritor sees the partner. I think as advisors, it's hard not to see the partner. Oh, this new person has come in. Oh, let's include the new person. It's hard not to just see them as that new person. And what you realize speaking to these couples is that for many of these inheritors, that partner was the first person that saw them as the adult that they are striving to be. The first person that didn't see them as a next gen or somehow subtly subordinate to a family wealth ecosystem and overarching infrastructure. They saw them as this potential romantic partner for life. And what I then heard from the inheritors is they wanted to be that. They wanted to live up to that expectation. And for many of them, it was that sort of almost bequeathed autonomy and agency that spurred them to become that person. And so I both want to see them as that as an advisor, but I also want to, there's a whole other talk about needing to help the wealth generating parents understand who this person is in their child's life. They're not the sort of interloper. They're not the threat. They're not the even the person they don't quite understand. They might be the gift that their child needs to become the person they've been striving to become. 
and helping parents understand that subtle difference. Because often when parents see their child changing, when they met a partner, they think that is bad, that the partner is changing the child. When in reality, I think all of us in life individuate in our 20s and often do that even more so through a wonderful relationship. And so these inheritors are basically becoming the people they were meant to be and the partners helping them do that. So helping parents see that versus seeing this person as a threat. I think that's something I will try to be much more proactive about both in my own work and with my counseling to parents. And I should say, obviously, I'm not talking about, we all know relationships that shouldn't have worked out from day one. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the relationships that should work, but that sometimes get hung up in all this stuff, all this wealth stuff. I thought one of the interesting wrinkles of the book is the adjustment of the partner coming into the relationship who didn't come from a background of wealth and that they actually have to make an abbreviated journey that the inheritor has already been on. That was interesting for me too. What you realize is as these people grow together and they become unified unit partners together in life, they are both sharing in this adjustment of needing to integrate this wealth with their identity. And there's a wonderful story from one woman who described that whole arc. She's like, look, when we first met, I thought it was his problem, really. The family money was his problem and like it was the other. And then what happens as they spend more time together, they eventually get married, they start to organize their life and their decisions around the fact that there is this money. She said, I woke up one day and realized this is our money and I need to go through all of the adjustments that he did. And thankfully, I have the 10 years of listening to him try to process this as a model But just almost this sort of surprise that she was realizing that these are all now, I can't say this is just his problem anymore. And all the corollary sort of pain that I think some of these partners experience when family members, friends, others changed their, the way that they approached them, started to treat them as wealthy, started to treat them as someone who could be helpful to them financially. It was like they jumped through the looking glass and could never go back. Um, and I think that's sometimes something that we as an industry don't quite recognize either. The partner is the married and the one who doesn't necessarily have all the same identity journey issues. And I saw that, no, they're in it too. They really are. So we can help with them with that. So we used to call these relationships fiscal goals, but now it's moved more to economic diversity. But you note that Inheritors often find the universe of potential partners small. How should inheritors think about finding partners? Yeah, I do talk about this, kind of the different tax people sometimes try to take to insulate themselves from pain. Maybe if I just date other people with money, I won't have to deal with this voice inside myself that says, I don't even know how to broach this topic with someone who doesn't have money. But where I come out is what I heard in the stories of the people I interviewed, which is that 80% of them, 77% of the couples I interviewed were a partner who viewed themselves as an inheritor with someone who wasn't. And I actually think that is great. I think that inheritors should not limit themselves to people who they think in some ways matches their socioeconomic background. I think what they should do is find someone who, Myra Salser talks about this concept of a money neutral partner. I pick up on that. I talk about the four success factors from my first book to make sure an inheritor themselves, it's about proving to yourself you don't need this money so that you can then come back and engage with it with agency and authority, just like those who made it really. And an inheritor does well, I think, to find a partner who feels the same. Great, there's money, that's cool, but they are not either drawn to it, they're not there for the money, and they're also not so repelled by it that it's not playing a defining role in their identity, I'd say. I think it's really critical for inheritors to find partners who have a foundational sense of identity they have built for themselves and have constructed so that they can also withstand the sort of centripetal force, what Jay Hughes and Keith, I think, and Susan talk about the centripetal force of the black hole of wealth. You need 
the partner to be able to withstand that too. So the two of you can stand your ground together and be able to, in a healthy way, integrate the wealth, but not be so subsumed by it. That becomes your whole life. What kind of advice would you give to parents who are dealing with the delicate issue of the, the fortune hunter? I'm hoping actually this book will help these young inheritors be discerning themselves. I think that what's really tricky for parents is it's almost a no-win. You can see a person who you think is probably not great for your child, and I think the child needs to come to that conclusion on their own because at some point, I've just seen in life that if the parent inserts themselves into that very challenging situation, what they risk is alienation from the child. And when that relationship goes south, which it probably will eventually, if the parent has become alienated from the child, then has no one to go to. I had some wonderful parent generation people I interviewed who shared with me some really challenging situations of knowing their child was headed into a marriage with a person who maybe wasn't a fortune hunter, but was probably just not great. It was not probably a great fit. And just needing to let that play out and be there for their child when it eventually didn't work. I think the most important thing a parent who is concerned about this, rightfully concerned about this, can invest in is the child's own self-esteem, the child's own sense of capability. And I think when children grow up into young adults who feel confident in their own abilities, they are much better able to figure out if a partner is there for the right reasons or not. The reason I devoted the first chapter of the book to helping these young inheritors take up the mantle from their parents and say, look, maybe your parents didn't raise you to be the perfect human being. Who's due? And you can, this is your one and only life. You can do this. You can do the work to help yourself feel confident and able to build a sense of self-efficacy. And I encourage them to do that because what I sometimes see is when people haven't gotten there, when they're still feeling a lot of shame about inherited wealth or insecurities or all kinds of things, they choose partners to help them fix those problems. They choose the sort of person who hates money because they feel a lot of shame about the money. And what I say is those relationships tend not to go well because it's really the inheritor seeking a solution outside themselves for something that has to be wrestled with in their own mind. So. I think parents should help their children build their own sense of capacity and self. And then I think they'll be able to make good decisions about their partners. I think you said something about not necessarily trying to find the right person, but making yourself the right person. Yeah, exactly. That I think you have to first of all know who you are. My results are, I think I quote her, she says, you know, you need to feel good about yourself and know who you are because you want the person to fall in love with you, the real you. You need to think about who am I? Who is the real me? Who is the real me without this wealth or alongside this wealth? Or all of that is something I find young people who will inherit, have inherited, or even if they never inherit, grew up sufficiently shaped by parental influence that has stamped their psyche. They need to wrestle with these issues. And I think it's very helpful if they try to really engage in those issues meaningfully. And then I think make progress there. And then if they can meet a partner, I think a partner can help them continue along that journey. One of the more interesting chapters in the book is about prenuptial agreements. I think you're trying to challenge some of the ways that the industry has thought about prenups. What is your thinking on that? Yeah, I I should say it's not that I'm anti-prenup in all cases, later life marriages, blended marriages, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm really talking about here is the very common set of circumstances where you have an inheritor who has inherited usually liquid wealth, very largely liquid wealth in the form of a trust. And that wealth they've inherited is probably a small portion of what they will likely inherit over the course of their life. But the industry norm is in those circumstances to encourage that young person to get a prenuptial agreement. And what happens is, and I heard, and I can tell you in much more detail why I think this is not great, but typically it's not the inheritors asking for it. It's sometimes not even the parents asking for it. It's some advisor swirling around the mix, some attorney or some wealth advisor who counsels these parents that it would be really 
irresponsible to not have this child do the prenup. And often that advice comes in close to the final hour. You know, what I would define as the inheritor has said, okay, we're getting married. I love this person. We've been together for eight years. They're wonderful. Oh, you should probably think about a prenup. And what I talk about is how in that set of circumstances, when a prenuptial agreement is put on the table at pretty much the final hour by a third party, it's so destructive. And I talk about four areas of the relationship dynamics between the inheritor and their partner that it's destructive to. One is agency, two is loyalty, three is unity, and four is equality. And I devote a chapter to explaining why those things are critical and stories showing how these young people who were faced with that set of circumstances weathered that situation. And they're all positive, eventually, (laughs) stories. But what in the stories, and, and I'll say, Joe, like I said, I was on hallowed ground. This part in particular of my discussions with these couples was the most emotional interviews I have ever done in all the interviews I've done. I had people who were married 35 years ago who started crying again, remembering how this prenup process went for them. And so when I said earlier, I feel I have a duty to share these voices, it's particularly around this prenuptial issue because I realize I have also been in the camp of people who have probably created pain and stress for couples like this by going down the typical wealth advisor, risk management checklist. Oh, we've got a marriage in the offing. Let's talk about a prenuptial agreement. And it's just so much more nuanced than that. And I do have a couple, which is the exception that proves the rule, which is a couple that both had inherited their money outright. They had about the same amount of money. They both wanted a prenup. So for them, they had agency. They were unified. There was no loyalty issue because it wasn't them versus some parent or them versus some advisor. And they had equality because they both had the same amount of money. They loved their prenup. They were one of the few who were so happy they had a prenup. And it's because they had those dynamics working for them instead of against them. And I leave it in the second chapter devoted to this to, in the few instances, I come out saying, I actually don't think you need prenups in most first marriages under the set of circumstances we talked about. But in situations where they're absolutely required, like a pot trust worth $3 billion that 150 family members will benefit from. I talk about a family that shared with me, this couple said, best gold standard process for how to have this go well if you really must do one. And again, not surprisingly, it worked well because all of the advisors in that situation were thoughtful about how to preserve as much as possible for that young couple, their sense of agency. They didn't create a loyalty divide. They allowed them to be unified through a mediated process versus opposing counsel. There were things that were done. And so I really wanted to share that as to say, there are things we can do as an industry to try to preserve the couples, these dynamics in a way that helps them feel unified. And I should say, I quote from this wonderful book called The Generous Prenup, which I really recommend everybody read by this attorney, Lori Israel. And she totally (laughs) agrees with this view about how prenups can be destructive in this circumstance. She calls them shadow parties, the people who put it on the table. It's a good name. Um, And then she talks about she's a prenup mediator, a better way. And part of what she defines as a better way, which I have really come to agree with too, is prenups that are generous to the less moneyed partner. It's crazy, actually. I talk about how in the history of prenuptial agreements, prenups actually were created to protect the less powerful, less moneyed partner. They were protected. They were protective of wives who had no rights, essentially. So if their husbands died on the battlefield or whatever, they could keep the house. They could keep their kids in the house because otherwise they're out. And how ironic that now it's turned on its head and really... The standard prenuptial exists to protect the more moneyed partner. And what Lori advises and what I see working well is when couples instead find ways to think about how to be generous to the party coming in with less. How do we say pay off that school debt? How do we make the house be jointly owned even if I'm putting the down payment in with my trust money? It was basically investing in the marriage, building financial entrepreneurship in the marriage that the couple can things the couple can do together and feel good about, that tends to be relationship enhancing other than 
versus the typical prenuptial process, which does typically the opposite. It's a term of convenience in the industry to, to call people next gens, but you think that we should reconsider that. Yes, I really do. I know there have been efforts. and I like rising gen. I certainly prefer rising gen to next gen. And I know it's a term of convenience. I thought actually, I spent about a week trying to see if I could come up with a cool acronym that would, what I did with age. That was an acronym that I chose. Just trying to see, is there any, I think the closest I got to was like people individuating amidst wealth or something, but it never was an easy thing that anyone would remember. So I gave up on that. But the point being, I think we just do such a disservice calling people next gens. There's a wonderful quote from one of the young people I interviewed. She went off on this for about a paragraph about how infantilizing she finds that. Why are we calling people in their 40s next gens? And when we do that, we just remove agency from them. And that's in the same chapter as, I don't love the word stewardship either, because Sure, there's elements of stewardship, which are good. But I think as an industry, we've sometimes gone too far by making stewardship seem like the outcome. It seemed like the end result when really next young, see, there I go. See, we all have to, we have to all hit ourselves in the head when we say that because I, and I have to do it myself. We need a better term. The final chapters of the book are, are, are very thoughtful about the attitudes we have towards generational wealth and dynastic wealth. There was a quote, I think it was page 179, and I'm just paraphrasing. It was, wealth managers feel like they have to create all these structures and meetings and retreats to pass the wealth from one generation to the next, but it is generational versus the individual. You're setting up systems where everyone is forced to stay together and you eventually get people who don't know each other and who don't like each other. How can people deal with these issues? Yes, that was a quote, a very good quote from one of my interviewees. This is a huge issue. I think it's one worth really thinking about as an industry. And it's complicated. There are certain, inst- where I basically come down on it with this is, of course, there are many circumstances. Really, the entire family enterprise c- consulting world is around circumstances where there is an ongoing operating business that is already the mechanism by which family members are tied together. So if you are one of these people where there is something in your life that is already tying you to family, for sure you need governance mechanisms. You need ways to have everyone's voices be heard. You need all of the stuff that our industry recommends. But what I find is that because that content is out there and that knowledge is thought to be so accepted and best practice, it has now been a brush applied to situations where you wouldn't need to have people in lockstep, people who inherit a $20 million or $40 million portfolio that's basically liquid assets, and so does their sibling. Those people can get all of their wealth management stuff done on their own in a way that is most reflective of their own nuclear families wishes and values. They can also then choose to go to family reunions and honor family traditions and even perhaps use some of their money collectively to fund a family reunion tradition fund. Basically trying to disaggregate, we have an assumption in the industry that you have to stay together to responsibly preserve wealth. And so I'll leave aside the second assumption question, which is, do these young people even want to preserve the wealth? That's a whole other thing. But even if you say you want to preserve wealth, I'm just trying to introduce the voices of these inheritors who are now questioning that assumption that you must be forced together to do that. Because what's also fascinating is in these interviews, I saw this just recurring generational pull toward autonomy. One of the women says, it's just ironic that we set this family office up 30 years ago so that the parent generation could separate from their cousins. And now here we are just trying to have that same sort of autonomy. And each generation has this drive to create a system that they feel as parents reflects their values for their own children. And when you start to then have that have to apply beyond that narrow nuclear family lens, it becomes challenging. And what I specifically saw in a number of the interviews is the breaking point tends to be when you have inheritors who are now parents themselves, they've got, say, teenagers, they start to think hard about what they didn't appreciate about how things went for them in their own life. And then they start to say, 
I don't want that for my kids. And then if they feel that whatever family wealth, infrastructure, family office, whatever thing is locking them into a solution that disagrees with their parenting values, it's a real critical breaking point. And I heard that in a number of interviews that I did. That was the impetus. Even stuff they had lived with for themselves for 30 years that they didn't love, but it was okay when it was just them. When they started to think about it being for their kids, they said, we've got to, we've got to change this. So yeah, I wanted to get that perspective across so we can have a dialogue as an industry to, to think about how we can preserve the best parts of togetherness. I'm not anti-togetherness. Also see that when people are given the freedom to truly go their own way, sometimes they choose to come back together. They choose to work on philanthropy together. They choose to do things together. And I think that's a very different quality of interaction than when they feel forced to do it together. What advice would you have for family members who feel like their family wealth is becoming institutionalized and it's taking on a life of its own? I think they should try to, first of all, know that the, what they feel is normal. What I heard in these interviews was such shame. Literally, it took people 15 years, 10 years to even get up the courage to ask the question, might there be another solution? Might there be a way to do this that doesn't involve doing this together? And so I guess I'd want people to say, what you're asking is normal. It, you're not, this is not a failure of governance. This is normal. And actually get some advice. Some of the stories, one person hired a family wealth consultant first, and then that her person helped them realize they could hire a new trust estates attorney. And then that person helped them realize they could actually replace the trustee. And it was a five-year, very challenging process. And I won't mince words with anyone. This couple that shared this with me, it was the hardest thing they'd ever gone through to separate from their family's wealth management infrastructure. That said, they say now they only wish they'd done it earlier. Their whole life has greatly improved since they made that break, but it was very challenging. There were so many little wrinkles in this book that I hadn't seen before. One of them was the woman who thought her trustee had made the money for them so she should listen to his wishes. Even the, it's her money, clearly. Right. I think for outsiders, maybe reading this book, they might be really surprised that some inheritors feel the way they do. But if you think about being born into a situation where the sky is blue, this is it, like the fish in the pond and talks about that trustee as being is lauded for having built the, you know, to grow the wealth for 15 years of family meeting. She shows up and everyone's talking about this. It takes such courage actually to even, and insight. Actually, it wasn't even until her partner was like, this, some of this stuff isn't normal. Could we maybe think about doing this another way? That comes up a lot too. It's often the partner who wasn't born into this pond that looks at this from a fresh perspective and is, huh, this is just, there, there's probably other ways to look at this. And what's really, I think, sad and poignant about that is that as an industry, that partner often gets blamed as the instigator, the troublemaker, the person who's forcing the inheritor to split off, when really all that partner is doing is offering perspective that almost awakens in the inheritor their natural agency. Oh, yeah this doesn't feel great. And yeah, oh, there could be a different way to do this. And I heard a lot of inheritors crediting their partner with not only helping them to get a sense of perspective, but being the one who had the courage and the persistence and the fortitude to continue to plow through in all of the really challenging emotional stuff that happens when you try to split off from the family. In that story, you're talking about people were disinvited to family meetings, people were blamed for hurting the trustee's feelings. There's just a lot of stuff that is very challenging to go through as a person, any person. <laughs> but it was really the strength of their unity with their partner that imbued them with that fortitude to keep going to a different outcome where now they feel, finally, my wealth can be integrated with myself. My wealth can be integrated with my values. I feel like I can parent in the way I want to parent. I finally can be excited about philanthropy, joy and the freedom and the like truly jubilation you hear in the voices of people who've come through that was, it was stunning really to hear that. And I want people to be able to feel that and know that they can get there, even though it might be really hard in the process. 
There's parts of the book that call into question attitudes around generational wealth. You noted that people are questioning whether dynastic accumulation of wealth is a worthy goal. Do you think this is a trend? I think it's a trend for sure. I think we have societal wealth and equality reasons it's a trend. We have general leaning against capitalism reasons it's a trend. Um, but I say, you know, lest your reader, you're sitting here thinking this is the province of millennials or maybe just one political persuasion or whatever. And I quote Carnegie and he said in Gospel of Wealth and he said the same thing. Is it a good thing for a person to leave their child wealth? It's not good for the child and it's not good for the state. And I don't come down on one side here. I think it truly is an individual decision. What I'm really trying to do is give voice to the people who are questioning it, because I think it's just such an assumption in our industry that shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, always talking about it's the worst, horrible, most worst thing if the money goes away. And what you hear from a lot of these younger people is it's almost a claim again for agency. I don't want my parents just deciding on my behalf to give my children more money. I would like to be included in that decision. A, I'd like to have a role as a parent in that decision, but B, that's really not a goal of mine. I'd rather be able to think more broadly about what the goals are here. And I'm still, by the way, trying to figure out what to do with my 50 million. Like there, there's just some questioning going on that I think we will be well served if we listen to and help our wealth generating clients think about and also help them perhaps talk openly and honestly with their children about what are our goals? Is more always better? What should we be doing? My view and what I see all the time is that generally speaking, the wealth generating parent, the answer of giving the child the money is the default. It's the default. Like, why wouldn't I want to give my child money? I don't love anyone as much as my child. Nothing gives me as much pleasure as seeing this money go to my child. And so it's the default. And what I heard from many of these people I talked to is they don't want it to just be the default anymore. They want there to be some thought around that decision. What is the concept uh, to you of breaking free? Yeah, I call that chapter breaking free, which is what I was hearing from these people about striking out for autonomy. This whole book, in many ways, is about the journey of individuation and identity formation that an inheritor goes through and often then goes through and is helped in, in concert with their partner. In the chapter I write about parenting as an inheritor, I encourage people to ask themselves the question, am I the grown up I would like my child to be? And that's a hard question. And often the answer is maybe not in some areas. And what I found is that this typically, this issue of how wealth management is being handled for me in my life was for many people, the last area in which they did not feel that they were a grown up. Someone else was making the decisions. Someone else was setting the course. And there was a deep sense of misalignment, I'd say, between what this individuating person and the grown-up they want to be would do and what they were living with. And so breaking free, I think, is bringing those things into alignment. It's looking at the entire landscape of your wealth management ecosystem, your wealth advisor, your trustee, your attorney, your all of these things and saying, does this work for me? Is this, and I don't mean work for me as in some sort of not beneficial way. Am I getting the distributions I want? Is this serving my development into the adult that I want to be? And are these people caring about the goals that I have in my life? And if you feel like they're driving a different bus <laughs> and you're just along in the passenger seat, that's not good. You need to be driving that bus because you are an adult. And I think that's when I talk about stewardship versus ownership. I think the people who I interviewed, many of them finally, after years of effort, got to a feeling of ownership. Finally, I feel that my wealth is integrated with my true self. And part of that, getting to that point was this breaking free thing. They had to get people in their corner who they felt served that goal versus not. What is the difference between stewardship and ownership? I use the, in, I use the sort of metaphor of, of driving a car. I think stewardship to me, is sitting in the back seat while someone else is driving the car. Ownership is you're behind the driver's seat. You're in the driver's seat, hands on the wheel. You're deciding where to go. 
And what I say is, you might even be deciding to go to the same place. But until you're in the driver's seat, you don't really know if that was your decision or you're just really along for the ride. And so, again, I think this is half to the industry. How do we help people really feel like owners? And that's a big question because we've got a lot of trusts that never really give people outright ownership and they are working with trustees until their 60s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I find is once people become these capable adults, they want to be treated that way. They really want to be viewed in the same degree of influence and authority as the wealth generator would be. And I don't think as an industry, we are doing a great job treating the inheriting generation with the same degree of authority and agency as we would treat the wealth generator. And I think we need to think through that and all the many ripples through our industry that impacts, including trust structures and all sorts of stuff. Why is the movie Love Story a good way to understand inherited wealth? Oh, thank you for asking about the movie section, Joe. Yes, there is a little recommended movie section at the back of the book because this was one of the benefits about writing about something as universal as love. Hollywood gets love. And there are some fantastic movies that really explore the very themes that this book talks about in very deep ways, including Crazy Rich Asians. But Love Story in particular is a wonderful example of how to be a parent welcoming a new partner to family and how not to be a parent welcoming a new. And I don't want to give too much away, but if anyone watches that movie, if you just compare her father and his father, and then take note of who is still in the relationship by the end of the movie, it's and what it comes down to is essentially realizing that the course of life is essentially to allow those coming after you to define their own life and define their own existence. And to the degree you can be accepting of that and be inquisitive about that and be curious and make space for that definition and autonomy, I think you will be in the person's life. To the degree you don't, you won't. And it's just a wonderful movie. That's a sad one though. Then you need to watch some of the happier ones. Did you think it was a positive message in Crazy Rich Asians? I think that's actually an excellent movie. I think it gets somewhat maligned. But I think a couple things. I think that they first of all get to some very deep, some very deep issues. The issue between the, I forget whether the cousin or the sister, but who ends up in the relationship that doesn't work out with the guy who always felt lacking because of her wealth. That is the fiscal unequals issue played out on the big screen. And I think what she says to him when she gets out of the car I can't make you feel like a man. I forget what she says, but I think it's in a very deep way getting to this issue of self-esteem and psyche that we talk about couples struggling with when one partner, particularly because of gender norms, historically, the woman comes in with inherited wealth. I also think I talk about in the prenup chapter about loyalty and how there's some unbelievable stuff about how critical, not surprisingly, loyalty is important in a relationship, but relationships experts talk about betrayal being at the heart of the failure of every relation that fails is often failing because of betrayal. And I quote from a relationship expert who says, non-sexual betrayals, including siding with a parent over your partner, can be as devastating as adultery. And I say, how crazy then that a typical prenup process that we do as an industry asks inheritors essentially to betray their partner and prioritize their parent or their family's money just at that most tender time of possibility in the relationship. And Crazy Rich Asians gets this down. As do a number of the movies on that list, there's this fork in the road moment where the inheritor partner is given a choice and they are able to then demonstrate the degree of their love and loyalty for their partner by saying, I would leave this all behind. I'd leave the money behind. I'd leave the role in the family firm behind. I'd do it all for you. And of course, because it's movies, some other solution always presents itself. So it doesn't have to be that draconian. But same thing happens in Coming to America, by the way. But there's, but there is this cinematic tradition of putting on the screen that critical moment where the inheritor can say, I would choose you. I would choose you over everything else. And that's a demonstration of loyalty. And it tells, it signals to the audience, okay, they're going to work out. This is going to work. And. I think that movie does it so well because he says that. But she wisely says, 
I don't want you to do that. That's not really a life that I would choose either for you to have left everything behind for me. Isn't there some option where these can be combined? And thankfully, mom deals with her issues and is okay with it. And, and then we have the end scene on the plane and it all works out. Yay. But yeah, but that is, sorry if that was a spoiler, but anyway, but yeah, it's surprisingly deep, that movie. So, what about what it happened one night? I've never seen that one. Why did why is that one? Oh, on the list? that is the best movie. This is Clark Gable, I think, Claudette Colbert. Gotta mm-hmm. watch that movie. What that is about, the movie opens with her jumping off her father's yacht because she doesn't want to marry, or she does want to marry the guy that her father does. Anyway, but what ends up happening is the whole movie is about becoming who you really are and individuating from this life of wealth. And how she does that is she meets the reporter who is Clark Gable on the lam. And she thinks he doesn't know who she is, but he does know who she is. But basically in the two days or three days they spend, she's on the lam, she's being hunted for by the authorities. They're like on a bus traveling through the South to just whatever. But in that period of time, she does all these things and proves to herself how capable she is that she wasn't doing when she was on the yacht. And at the end, sorry, spoiler alert for anyone who wants to watch that movie, but there's also a critical moment where he then proves to the dad, I'm not here for the money. I'm really here for who your daughter really is. And I see her for who she really is, which by the way, you should see her for who she really is. It's a beautiful movie that shows the role of the right partner in helping a inheritor truly individuate into the self they meant to be. And it's great. It's also just, a fun movie. The book is called Engaged, Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise. The author is Coventry Edwards Pitt. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure. Really nice talking to you. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and take a minute to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate it.